Okay, this is, it's good to be here in Erbil without having to go to war. I mean, it's a good sign. I don't have to take pictures of fighting. You're at peace. So that's the first good thing about today. This is how it all started for me. On the left, you have my father. On the right, you have my uncle. They were both soldiers during the Second World War, during the Indochina War, and during the Algerian War. And then they became reporters. They're the ones that told me, you must never forget about war. You must talk about it. You must show war, because it's our biggest enemy. And if you don't know your enemy, you're going to lose. So my job is to cover wars so we can fight war the right way. If you want peace, you have to know war. If you ignore war, the war will come to you by surprise. So my job is to endlessly tell the story of the wars around the world so people don't forget. Um, some people during the Second World War in Germany said they didn't know what happened. Maybe it's true. Today, you can't say that because we're, reporters are everywhere. So if you don't know, that means you didn't want to know. And if you don't want to know, that means you're responsible for it, you don't know. So our job is to make a little noise in the head of the politicians who declare war all the time. As we say, old people declare war, young people die. You know, and it's the same story. I started in Vietnam. Uh, in 1968, and I, I have the impression of doing the same pictures today. It's always the same thing. You have people that are fighting for ideas, and then the ideas change, and the fight change, but it's still the same thing. I mean, on my bag, I have written SSDD, same shit, different day. You know? So, this is what creates refugees. Refugees come from there. They're trying to escape all this. And then you have the religion problem. This is Beirut. Christians, uh, a priest, the Palestinian. I mean, he's been fighting for so long, his hand looks like bullets at the end, you know. Palestinians have been fighting forever. My first real story was 67, the Israeli war. I still go to Israel. That's more than 50 years ago. It's ridiculous. I mean, it's a small country. Why are they keep, can't they find a solution? Maybe somebody doesn't want a solution, you know. And this is Lebanon. Now, one of the problems in Lebanon, see, when the refugees came from Jordan, and suddenly it was too much refugees for the people to accept. It's a small country, and the army was not strong. So when turmoil started, it took over the whole country and became a civil war. That's the danger. You have to have a strong country to accept civilians, but to, to accept refugees. Like in France, we had the refugees from Algeria, and it worked out really well, because they, had, they knew how to do agriculture. They knew a lot of things that we didn't know. And so they brought us um, their knowledge. The thing with uh, refugees, if you have to take out their qualities and put them inside your own country, uh, otherwise they're gonna turn around and around and around and just become refugees like, it's, it'll become like a name. I mean, I'm a refugee, but that doesn't mean anything. Uh, you have to, from a refugee, become something else. Like the Vietnamese. You know, the Vietnamese, uh, they were sent to different countries. They integrated. Uh, they first opened restaurants and things like that. They worked. They were integrated in the system. If, if they stay as refugees, they keep waiting to come back, and they don't at the end. So it makes them uh, like a ghetto. You know, that doesn't work. And, uh, well, this, I mean, even the cat is running away. So... Why would the Lebanese want to stay if a cat who has seven lives is running away, you know? Um, 
the, the tank was from the Christian army. The cat, I don't know. Uh, so this is the Lebanese war. And this is Haiti. The Haitians were fleeing like hundreds of people, risking their lives uh, to cross the sea to go to Miami. Uh, that's the first time they were allowed to vote. You can see it didn't work out. You know. And so I decided to go with them on the boat. They were going from, to Miami. But once we were on the boat, I found out that we were going probably to London, the direction he was taking. So at the end, we sunk. The boat sunk. Only 14 people survived. But it's, this is a Palestinian in Jenin. I asked him, what's the picture behind? It's the wall of his dining room. And he said it was a picture on his wall. He called it the Palestinian dream. Afghanistan. Now you have this civilian overlooking the Canadian soldiers. And that night, the Taliban sent a message to the soldiers saying, OK, you have the technology. You won this battle. You have the watch, but I have the time. This guy was born here. He's going to stay here. The Canadians have already left. This is a British soldier, Afghan. This is two generations. I met the old guy fighting the Russians, and that's his son who is fighting us. So SSDD, you know. This is Libya. Now we know how that went, you know. And this is, well, this is Bashika. That was not a long time ago. The, you know, the offensive. That's the Kurd army, the Peshmergal, you know. <laughs> His tank commander has just been killed, so he's crying. Bashika. I don't know what these Americans were doing there, but helping. Uh, this is Mosul, the Golden Division. Refugees, you know. So these people are here. I think 600,000 people are in Erbil. What are they going to do? I mean, because we were talking, uh, I was talking with different people today and saying, how can we integrate them in our system? But I think the, the, the best solution would be to stop the fighting, you know, get the problem at the root. How, you know, they can't live there anymore. This is Mosul. Uh, when I came back to Paris after several wars, people didn't care about what was happening. They say it's far away. So I made this montage of pictures saying, well, look how Paris would look like if you're not careful. So it was just trying to show the people that if you want to fight the war, you have to know exactly how the war functions. In Afghanistan, I, I heard like in the wind one night, a voice saying, I change borders, I make kings, I kill kings, I put the brother against the brother, 
the families against the families. I change borders. I defy you to not live without me. That's war. It's been going on for so long. I mean, I'm probably the only guy who wants to lose my job. I would love to be jobless. <clears throat> For the refugee thing, look at what happened in France. We have Algerians, we have Moroccans, we have African people, all our ancient colonies have come towards us. A lot of them integrated themselves, not all, because that's, that's life. But to think it's a good thing to find the qualities of each and use them and have them help us, you know, after all, we are the world champion of football. <laughs> and look at the French team. You have Africans, you have Sub-Saharians, you have Arabs, and you have Gaulois. But they're all French, and they all, all their qualities came together. So that was, I think we should all play football, you know. Maybe you have incredible good football players who come from Mosul. You should, you know, give them footballs and see what happens. Okay, it's just a joke, but still, it, it can show that, you know, in America, there's a guy who wrote a book, and it, he imagined that there was no more Mexicans in California. And the next morning, the Americans were like going, where's the Mexican? Where's my pizza? Where's my, who's going to look after this and that? The whole country would stop without the Mexicans. You need to have movement and different cultures to mix. It's impossible to work otherwise. We're all from refugee places. I mean, the French, are refugees from everywhere. The Americans, I mean, when they say, when Donald Trump, uh, this, this thing, says migrants brought in America criminality, drug, and violence, the Indian says, I know. But we are not the same here now. We're, we're, we're integrating people. And the worst thing is to be a refugee in your own country. I worked with uh, Kurdish reporters that helped me to work in Mosul. You know, Younes Mohammed is one of them. He's a reporter. He's here in this room. Barzan. And we worked together. We went to Mosul. And it was strange for Younes. He was himself a refugee. And he went to study in Iran and then came back to help me and tell the story of refugees himself. It's like a circle going on and going on. Our job is to try to break that circle. You know, really keep on talking about war so it stops. I mean, it's like a flood. You know, you have to be careful. It's, it's coming from everywhere. And try to tell the polit politicians you know, to think before they do something stupid. Because look at the results. We have our president that suddenly decided to go into Libya. We can see the result. That went well. You have the Americans come in Iraq. And you see what happened in Iraq. You know, th th you have people talking about other countries saying, I will put the solution, but they don't know about the country. George Bush, when he was elected, didn't have a passport. They had to make him a passport. How, how can he decide to take care of Iraq? He never left Texas. You know. So my job is to try to show what's happening so that people are accountable for what they do. And plus, I'd never forget the people. All these people I have in my pictures, I remember them. I have their name, I call them on the phone. I mean, I've been doing wars for 50 years, so that's half a century. And it's the same story. Voila, that's it.